it's kind of like a manual tinder with an added family element to it there's somewhat of a cultural divide slash racism involved <laughs> Hello Zesties, you're tuning in to the Gleeful Talk Show where we share zesty stories to cultivate the happiness and hero within and out. As you've noticed Zesties, I have been away for a few weeks. I'm so sorry about that. I was quite sick and busy as well. I was out in Sydney last week for work and also a couple of weeks ago as well. I was out in Melbourne so schedule has been quite hectic but not complaining so i just wanted to address that that's why i have been away for quite a while and i want to thank you for those who are still listening to this show when we started the new year my goal was to put out episode per week but just life happens and work has been extremely busy and there has been a lot of going on at work and my personal life as well so it's quite hectic so i'm just taking it slowly for now i got sick as well so i don't know if you could notice my voice it's a bit husky <laughs> but yeah i was quite sick for several days I'm, I'm still recovering now but i want to record this episode for you guys because i have been away for quite a while and before we dive right in there is an off chance testies that i will be taking another short break again for two to three weeks in may i'll try to put out more episodes but i'll just try my best so if you don't see an episode out that means i'm not well enough yet to put out an episode but thank you so much for your understanding. And if you're new to the podcast, welcome. In this show, we talk about personal development, society, and culture with pop culture thrown in the mix as well. Today, I want to talk about the Netflix series entitled Indian Matchmaking. I have seen this pop up before Zesties, but I thought it's not my cup of tea because I'm not Indian and I would just be perplexed about the things shown there. But one of my friends, my co-hosts actually from the Nerdy Fans podcast, Ray, messaged me and told me that doing a commentary about this TV series on the Gleeful Talk Show might be something you guys are interested in. So here I am talking about the show. So I was quite hesitant to watch this because of the reasons I mentioned earlier, but I've decided to give it a shot. And wow, I'm hooked. I actually started on season three, binge watched it until Netflix popped that question, are you still watching? <laughs> so I finished season three fairly quickly, maybe like two days, and now I'm on season one. So it's like going back, but that's okay because I think dating shows, it's fine to, to do it like that or reality shows. And it, funny enough, like there was actually a character or a person in season three that was actually shown in season one too so it's quite interesting and as someone who is not from india i found the show to be a fascinating window into cultural tradition that i was previously unfamiliar with the show follows matchmaker sima taparia as she helps her clients navigate the often complicated world of arranged marriages we see her work with a range of people from a successful businesswoman who is struggling to find a partner to a young man who is under pressure for his family to settle down. The practice of matchmaking in India has a long and rich history that dates back thousands of years. In ancient India, marriage was considered a sacred bond between two families rather than just two individuals. The matchmakers or intermediaries played a crucial role in finding a suitable partner for the bride and groom, taking into account various factors such as social status, family background, education, and horoscope. And interesting enough, on the show, they also showed a face reader 
who looks at the face of the couple, reads their face, and tells the matchmaker whether they are suitable for each other or if they have a future for each other. So it's also incorporated in the decision-making of the matchmaker. In many parts of India, especially in rural areas, the practice of arranged marriages still prevails. In these cases, parents or family members act as matchmakers and take the responsibility of finding a suitable partner for their child. They consider various factors such as caste, religion, family background, education, profession, and horoscope before finalizing the match. Matchmaking has undergone significant changes in modern India, especially in urban areas. Young people have more freedom to choose their own partners and dating and love marriages are becoming increasingly common. However, in these cases, families often play a significant role in the decision-making process and compatibility between the families is still considered an essential factor. The role of matchmakers has also evolved in modern times. Professional matchmakers such as the ones featured in the Indian matchmaking show have become more prevalent. And she, you know, Seema Auntie as they call it, find it hard now to match people up because the youngsters now have more choices, have more preferences. And as she said, they want it all. So, I mean, it's quite interesting how the mentality is different because Seema Auntie on the show always tells her clients that you should compromise. She didn't say settle, but she always say compromise. You cannot have it all. Although I have, you know, a different take on that, but I'll talk about it later on. The matchmakers help individuals find suitable partners based on their preferences, and they often charge a fee for their services, of course. In terms of cultural values, matchmaking in India is deeply rooted in the importance of family and community. Marriages are not just considered a union between two individuals, but also their families, and I mean extended families as well. This emphasis on familial harmony and compatibility is seen as crucial to a successful marriage. Although in the Philippines, matchmaking is not practiced, but there has been political marriages between wealthy families. Not entirely sure if this actually happens as I only see these on telenovelas, but most likely it does. But we also have a similar thing in our culture where we say, quote unquote, you not only marry the person, but you marry the whole family as well. That's why when a guy and a girl are still in the early stages of their relationship, he gets introduced to the family for the family to test if they are suitable for the daughter, but they don't have that much of a say anyway, I think, unlike the Indian culture. It's not really a formal meeting process, but it could be as well. And in olden times, the guy would need to show physical strength by chopping wood and stuff like that and would have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with the dad through drinking, you know, through drinking alcohol and such. Since I'm in the newer generation or modern generation, this type of meeting is, I think, not really common in my case anymore. So the culture has evolved significantly to adapt to the modern times. But I hope that some of the culture, even the stories get retained for future generation, just for them to understand as well the history and all. And I hope it gets written in history as well. Well, not necessarily practicing it, I would say, but more on for the future generation to understand more of the Philippine culture. And speaking of which, there is a practice called Pamamanhikan, which is deeply rooted in the culture and traditions of the country. It is an important part of the pre-wedding process in the Philippines, and it's seen as a way of showing respect to the woman's family. The practice of Pamamanhikan usually takes place after the couple has made the decision to get married. It is a formal visit by the man and his family to the woman's family home. The visit is usually scheduled in advance and may take several months before the wedding. 
During the pamamanhikan, the man and his family formally ask for the woman's hand in marriage. The family of the man usually brings gifts, or we call it pasalubong, for the woman's family as a sign of respect and gratitude. These gifts may include flowers, fruits, or other items. The pamamanhikan is also an opportunity for the couple and their families to get to know each other better. It is a time to discuss the details of the wedding, such as the date, location, and other important aspects. The families may also discuss other matters such as the wedding budget, the guest list, and the customs and traditions related to the wedding. In some cases, the pamamanhikan may also serve as a formal wedding announcement. The couple may exchange rings or other gifts gifts such as their commitment to each other. The practice of pamamanhikan is an important cultural tradition in the Philippines and is seen as a way of preserving the values and customs of the country. It is a way of showing respect and seeking the blessings of the woman's family before getting married. In some cases, the pamamanhikan may also help to ensure a harmonious relationship between the two families, which is especially important in the Filipino culture. And for me personally, I didn't really experience the pamamanhikan process just because I am not married to a Filipino and I was also away from the Philippines when that happened. But it's nice. It's nice to have this practice and I would encourage our younger generation to do this practice as well because... It's not like an arranged marriage kind of thing, but it's more of preserving the culture and also bringing the families, the two families together. But now back to Indian matchmaking zesties. So I remember in season one of the show, there was this very wealthy family and they hired the matchmaker Seema auntie to find a suitable partner for the 25 year old son the mom was extremely stressed out because the matchmaker has been sending a lot of profiles of the girls and they call it biodata or biodata it's a similar term actually we used in the philippines back in the day when we were applying for jobs but now we call it cv or curriculum vitae or resume but as you can see in india i mean as shown on the on this show that Finding a partner or matchmaking is some kind of a job interview as well. Very, very interesting. So the son named Akshay didn't want to see the girls. Actually, there were hundreds of girls that, you know, matched. It's kind of like a manual Tinder, I would say. <laughs> with an added family element to it so actually didn't want to see the girls to the point that his mom was extremely stressed impacting her health her blood pressure and all so in the end Akshay met this lady she has good family background as well and is actually studying towards becoming a chartered accountant so the 25 year old guy Akshay who didn't even date yet before this was extremely awkward understandably so when talking to this girl the mom was pressuring his son to get married by the end of the year wow 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 very interesting right it's not a laughable matter i would say zesties but it's very very interesting to see the big difference in this culture and it doesn't mean that you you know arranged marriages don't work because the show actually interviewed a lot a lot a whole lot of couples who were on arranged marriages and they were like married for i don't know like 40 years or you know 40 years 50 years and they married very early like maybe 19 or you know early early 20s and it worked for them you know so it's just really quite interesting to see this difference in culture and it's nice to learn different cultures which is why I'm, I, I really like watching it and also what I like about the show is that it doesn't only highlight one or two or three couples or individuals but keeps adding new sets of characters who are not only based in India but based outside of it as well and it doesn't even show that all of the people that went with the matchmaking service have found their happily ever after. So it shows a realistic side to it as well, which is what I appreciate so much. I also like that they feature one lady who is a businesswoman. I forgot her name now, but she's like what they call a modern Indian woman. She lives in India, 
but she's like a very independent woman and you know she was dating with the guys that the matchmaker have introduced her but eventually it didn't work out and then she said that she was still happy to do this matchmaking service because she understood more of herself and she is much more willing to invest in herself and her own business before deciding what works for her. Another thing that struck me about the show was the importance placed on factors such as family background, education, horoscopes, and even the face. The Western world tends to prioritize individual choice and compatibility, so it was interesting to see a different perspective. I would say that in the Filipino culture, previously it was similar thing like about the family and all but i think with the modern society now the individual choice of the person is also now considered has more way rather than the compatibility with the family and of course with filipino culture we are considered cariñoso which is i don't know whether the translation of this one in spanish is the same as how we look at it but we are quite romantic type of people so we are all for love Aww. anyway in the indian matchmaking show they emphasize that the arranged marriage is actually just called marriage they don't say it arranged marriage and if it wasn't through arranged marriage then they call it love marriage which is quite interesting again However, there are also some aspects of the show that were concerning. Like, for example, there was a clear bias towards fair skin, which is unfortunately not uncommon in many parts of the world. This was particularly evident in the treatment of one of the participants, a dark-skinned woman who was repeatedly told that she would have difficulty finding a partner because of her skin color. It was also notable how gender roles were reinforced throughout the show. Men were often shown as the ones with the power to choose, while women were expected to be obedient and prioritize their husband's needs over their own. There's usually the Sima auntie was emphasizing that the women or everyone should compromise and you should, you know, follow your husband. There was also another matchmaker on the show, which is not Sima, but a colleague of hers who mentioned to the character earlier that the businesswoman that I mentioned earlier, if the guy or your husband to be would move to somewhere in a different country or a different city, you would need to follow him. Like you would need to follow him, which was again, you know, I mean, there it's quite concerning. And I'm glad that that woman didn't follow that advice. So good on her. I also found that there's somewhat of a cultural divide slash racism involved. I know this might sound controversial and I might get cancelled soon, but hopefully not. But hear me out, Zesties. I get that there is a certain preference to a race or cultural background on who you want to marry. But one of the episodes, there was, there was a Sikh family, which is... Like, I think it's a religion in India. It's spelled S-I-K-H. And the dad only wanted the daughter to marry a guy who, who is also sick. The daughter was divorced. And mind you, being a divorcee has its own struggles as well, as you can see on the show. So there was a guy that the matchmaker introduced to the girl. The guy was also divorced, but not sick. Or was it sick? I think the guy was sick as well, but... He was previously married to an American girl and the dad was saying, quote unquote, oh, that's why, you know, showing disdain against the guy and he forbid the daughter to even meet that guy because he thinks that the guy doesn't respect their culture because he married an American woman. So <laughs> I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. And as you see, there is still some racism in the Asian culture, I would say. And it is important to understand that racism exists in all societies, and that includes Asian societies as well. Just like any other group of people, Asians may hold prejudices and stereotypes about people from different racial, ethnic, or cultural backgrounds. However, it is also important to recognize that Asians are not a monolithic group and that race 
racism can manifest in different ways across different Asian communities. For example, colorism, discrimination based on skin color, is a significant issue in many Asian countries where lighter skin is often considered more desirable. It is also important to acknowledge the impact of colonialism and imperialism in shaping the attitudes and perceptions of Asians towards different races and cultures. The legacy of colonialism and imperialism has contributed to the internalization of white supremacist ideals in many Asian societies, leading to the marginalization and discrimination of marginalized communities. It is crucial to recognize and challenge racism in all its forms, regardless of the race or ethnicity of the individuals involved. We should also strive towards building a more inclusive and equitable society that values diversity and celebrates the contributions of all people regardless of their racial or ethnic background. So when I was watching this show, I found myself rooting for these people, you know, like even if I don't know them. So it's quite fascinating. And I'd say that the creators of the show really did a good job because the non-Indian audience like me, still find it engaging and entertaining. And overall, I found Indian matchmaking show to be a thought-provoking and engaging show. It gave me a greater appreciation for the complexity of matchmaking in Indian culture while also highlighting some of the problematic aspects of that culture because, of course, each culture has its own advantages and something that needs to be updated to keep up with the times. I hope that by continuing to have conversations about these issues, we can work towards a more equitable and just society for everyone. Thank you so much, Zesties, for tuning in. If you like this episode, please share it to your friends and social media. I would highly, highly appreciate it. I will be starting to put up some short vlogs on the YouTube channel of this podcast. So, if you are interested, please check that out very soon. If you'd like to support the show and would like to give me a cup of coffee or two, please head down to the episode notes to find out how. And big thanks once again to Raru Suchin for the continued support. Any episode recommendations, Zesties, please let me know in the comment section or email to gleefultalkshow at gmail.com. If you'd like to share your thoughts on this topic, please send a voice memo, keep it relatively short, and send it to gleefultalkshow at gmail.com, and I might feature your entry on a future episode. Until then, keep living the gleeful life.